We have with us today Peter Robinson, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Technical Officer of Lucid Motors, known for its luxury sedan, the Lucid Air, which is outside here. You can go check it out yourself, and which was named the 2022 Motor Trend Car of the Year. We also have with us Linda Zhang. Thank you for being here as well. Linda was the chief engineer of the Ford F-150 Lightning, the first all-electric Ford pickup truck, which many are saying is the most important EV since the Tesla, if not the most important EV ever. Big, big stakes here. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Peter, let's start with you. Before coming to Lucid. You were at Tesla. You were the chief engineer of the Model S. You know what it takes to produce, design, and build electrical vehicles in mass. Not an easy task. Tesla is now on track to build more than a million cars this year. Lucid is having its challenges right now. Mm -hmm. Production forecasts were recently revised downwards to between 6,000 and 7,000 vehicles for the year from an original estimate of 20,000. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a sense, what is going on? Why is it proving so difficult to prove and develop and build these cars right now? Uh, it's hugely challenging and we've, uh, we're ramping up against the backdrop of supply chain challenges, largely in the wake of COVID, which mm -hmm. hasn't helped. Um, and I think also it's difficult sometimes for a, for a new entity to be taken sufficiently seriously by the supply base. That said, uh, I've been personally leading the drive of our ramp up in the factory, spending countless hours in the factory on the shop floor. And this morning we just announced that we've tripled our uh, numbers produced in Q3 over our Q2 number and are on track for our revised um, uh, advice for production for this year. So the ramp up is taking place. I'm very confident that we're going to nail this. Good, good. A lot of issues to get there. I'm just going to put pins in it. COVID, supply chain. There's a lot of factors affecting EV production and demand beyond whether people are ready to actually make the switch. Linda, to you. Ford has said, uh, obviously, a much bigger installation base, big factories already ready to go, that you're aiming to produce, it was at 150,000 F-150 Lightnings this first year? So 150 by the end of next year. By the end of next year. That's, that's a lot. And also, I think, I believe I saw a forecast for 600,000 EVs in total by the end of next year, if I have it right. Those are ambitious numbers. Given the, some of the challenges that Peter just addressed, how confident are you that even a company like Ford can meet them? I'm very confident. I mean, one of the things that we've worked on very hard is really making sure that from a supply chain perspective that we're, we're set up. And um, I'm glad to say that um, we have all of the battery materials needed for the 600,000 that's sourced. Um, so that's, that's, you know, one big step toward it. Now, of course, with COVID and with um, just general um, economic concerns in the industry, th there is a lot of other shortage issues that we have to worry about. And that's what we do every day to make sure that we get trucks out to our customers. Mm. Um, mm. But yeah, it'll be really important for us to start making up um, a lot of those vehicles to satisfy the um, um, the, the high reservation demand so far. For there is high reservation demand for Lucid as well. I mean, to be named 2022 Motor Trend Car of the Year, what did that mean to you when you saw that come through? I think it was a real validation point. Uh, we stri strive so hard as a team to really push the envelope, uh, to try to make a better electric car, to really push the technology by doing it in-house. And it all came to fruition with that award. Uh, because make no mistake, this is a technology race. Uh, we need to make more efficient, greener electric cars going further with less battery. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the objective of Lucid. That's what we're, we're set up to do, to create further range, to really attenuate uh, range anxiety, but to do that with less batteries, mm. because that has less impact and draw upon the world's precious resources. And this is absolutely crucial. 
We're going to come back to another one of those crucial issues, the world's precious resources, rare earth minerals. Peter, first, though, talk about this is not a cheap car. And, and, and uh, you took a similar approach that Tesla did when it mm. came out with the Model S, mm. which you were intimately involved with, in developing a really, truly luxury product. I believe the least expensive Lucid Air goes for somewhere in the range of $87,000. Is that right? Well, yes, up here will be $87,400. Yep. That, Let me bring that out this, uh, the, the, later this year. Actually. Yeah, Th that is obviously, mm -hmm. I don't need to state this, more than most people can afford to spend Indeed. On, Indeed. on a car. Indeed. So if EVs are just novelty items for the wealthy, can you really say that a company like Lucid with such relatively small numbers is going to be able to move the needle on climate issues and on emissions overall? Well, well I, I think this is widely misunderstood. Um, to start uh, an electric car company, it demands uh, significant capital. Yep. And the, the cost of industrializing a high-end product is much less than the cost of industrializing a low-end product. A great paradox is that the cost to uh, capitalize a factory uh, is almost inversely proportional to the cost of the product. For example, if you're making Rolls-Royce, it's an impossibly expensive product, but it's made in a relatively small quantities in a relatively small factory and requires a relatively small capital. So first of all, you have to be pragmatic. We would never exist as a business if I'd gone out to make a more mainstream, more affordable product. Why do you say that? Uh, because we would have required multi, multi billions more than we required. Uh, the, the cost of creating a factory for a product like a Volkswagen Golf um, is very significantly more than that for a high-end product because you've got a, 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 far, a far greater degree of automation that's required. That's the first thing. But the really important factor here is developing the technology that is only affordable today to relatively wealthy people but will be able to filter down into the mainstream. And there is a historical precedent. Uh, 120 years ago, uh, gasoline-powered cars were the preserve of wealthy people. Um, um, less well-heeled people rode horses. Uh, that, that's a simple fact. Yeah. The gasoline car was for the wealthy, but that technology came down market, and that's what had the great impact. And that's what we're doing. We're creating a, a premium luxury product, a luxury brand, and we will come down progressively down market, and the technology that we develop today, the super advanced technology, 900 volt architecture, over 500 miles range, and doing that with a smaller battery pack and achieving greater efficiency, that is gonna be a core driver to the reduction of cost and affordability of electric cars for everyone. We have to start high end. We're gonna drive that down. Yep. Over the next 10 years, Lucid is gonna go more mainstream. We have to start with a high end product. Okay, which is of course what Tesla has done, and we already heard about where their numbers are now. You at Ford also had to think about very similar set of issues. Can you give us some insight as to why you chose the F-150 as, I mean, I know the, the Mustang Mach-E was out there, but the F-150 is really in so many ways the company's first really, truly enormous swing at EVs. The F-Series is the best-selling uh, set of vehicles in the country, so you actually had a different perspective here. Talk to us about why the F-150, and, and to what extent you agree or perhaps disagree with some of Peter's remarks about part product market introduction. Yeah, and I mean, I think we come from a very different position, just like of course. You know, Peter said. Um, with, with, F1, with F-150, we're part of the F-Series family, best-selling truck for 45 years straight, and it's really a cultural vehicle as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's America's favorite vehicle. It's, um, so to electrify it was really a big bet in a way, because this is where the rubber meets the road in a way in terms of adoption. And that's partly why we did it, right? Because it's important for us to um, leverage the brands that we do have and in a way um, electrify our most iconic vehicles with Mustang, Transit, as well as F-Series to, to make sure that, that we can help with that adoption curve. Um, in the US, we really just started surpassing that 5% threshold where it goes from you know, more of a niche market to, to mass adoption. And in that, I think it's really important to do it right with the right products. And especially with the F-150, as we think about it from an affordability perspective, 
um, we really developed it so that it was at parity with gas trucks to help that transition to electrification. And then also, as, um, as we did the development work, we wanted to make sure that it was something that our customers can look at and say, that is a truck, and that's something I can see myself in. Mm. Um, and you know, adding to it, not just the fact that it's a truck, but all the electrification functionality that's just not even possible with a gas vehicle. Right. You mentioned affordability in there. Now, the F-150 Lightning is still not terribly cheap. What is, what's, <laughs> what's the entry level go for? Well, our entry level when we launched was less than $40,000, but I mean... I think it's gone up a few times this year, hasn't it? It's gone up a couple times this year, and I think, you know, that's something that we've seen across industry with everything. So does, uh, that, risk, does that risk the adoption curve, though? Does that risk bending it down? Um, I think it's still um, very much an affordable vehicle, and especially when you compare it to other vehicles, which everything has gone up in price, right? Unfortunately, my milk at home, my bread at home, everything's gone up. So from that perspective, um, it hasn't gone up drastically different. It's really gone up to accommodate for the material cost, the raw material cost increase, as well as just supply concerns in, in logistics. Um, but I think there's still gonna, from a total, cost perspective, total ownership perspective, it's still going to be much cheaper in the long run to buy an electric versus a gas. Mm. And this long-term perspective, I think, is something that a lot of people need to keep in mind when assessing EVs. I certainly, it's a topic of conversation that still comes up in the newsroom even, is how do we measure not only the affordability of an EV over time, but its carbon footprint over time. And I'd love to hear from both of you, especially with a big truck that takes a lot of materials and a big battery, and a luxury sedan which has extraordinarily high finishes and leather and wood probably inside the cockpit, how you think about the real overall carbon footprint of this vehicle compared to a conventional car. Peter, can you really say with all of those finishes, with the rare earth minerals that are required for a battery, albeit a smaller one, that the, your cars are truly, on the long-term basis, better for the planet than, say, a Mercedes? Well, I, I, yeah, there's a, there's a simple measure that uh, I can apply here, and it's kind of a, a measure for an EV tech company, and that is how far can you go with how small a battery? We're, we're just, I think we're, uh, some people in the audience are having a hard time hearing you, so I'm gonna ask you to speak up just a oh, little nice. and to raise, right. Right. raise the mic. Can you, can, uh, raise Thank the mic. You. Right, okay. Oh, got right. it. There we go. Thank the mic's you. Mic's in the wrong place. Sorry. You're trying to dodge the question. Right. No, I, I wasn't right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Is that clearer? It's not just my accent. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think that um, it's, it's, it's an absolutely valid point. Our objective is to go as far as possible with as small a battery as possible. And that is the measure of the environmental footprint of an electric car, independent of how big it is or how luxurious it is. So we're able to do, and, and there's a way of measuring this, it's like gas mileage, how many miles per gallon. The new gas mileage is miles per kilowatt hour. That's the electric equivalent. And we can get 4.6 miles per kilowatt hour with our Grand Touring version of, of Lucid Air. And no one else is, that, is close to that. So it's effectively the electric equivalent of gas mileage. Now, of course, where is that energy drawn from? And the great thing is that electricity can be 100% produced from sustainable sources, solar, wind, um, hydroelectric, you name it. There's, so we, you know, I, I, I can't solve the, the, the problem of where the electricity is, is generated from. That's for other people to take. I can do the car part. And let's not, as an individual, try to solve this whole puzzle because it's much more complex than that. But my mission is to make electric cars higher tech, more efficient so they can go further with less battery. And because the battery is the biggest single cost item on an electric car, that's gonna drive down the price. And that's why we will be able to make the next generation of lucid cars more affordable because we can make them with smaller battery pack than anyone else and that's the big ticket item for making an EV, the cost of the battery. So we can make a, a car go further, smaller battery, lower cost and more impact into the mass market and that's what's going to catalyze humanity's broader uptake of sustainable mobility. That's the plan. Okay. Linda, I saw your eyebrows raising a few times during his remarks. Do you agree with his assessment 
that, that, that that's the proper way to measure the success of an EV? Um, I think that's a very good way. I mean, efficiency is definitely something that's really important for, for vehicles because, you know, the more efficient you can make it, definitely the less materials you're going to need. Mm. So I completely agree with that. Um, I think the bit I was going to maybe add is I think in total there's been a lot of really good studies, and a very recent one out of the University of Michigan actually looked at this situation yep. from beginning to end from a total, cycle per, total life cycle perspective and showed that it was 46% you know, less um, from a from from a EV perspective than a gas perspective. So I think you know, with that and this opportunity um, to get to even more sustainable and um, less, uh, you know, more carbon neutral electricity production, right? With wind, solar, all of those things that you know we have on Earth for free, really, um, it is really leading us to potentially a better place. Yeah. Um, and then, especially if you take into the, the total life cycle of also recycling, um, I think that, you know, that of the battery and the materials, there's a lot that you can potentially get back to reuse again. Yeah. A reminder, we want to hear from you. So please, uh, if you have questions, write them on these note cards, very high tech that are in your seat. And magically, they will translate from pencil and paper and magically appear on the iPad. Uh, so don't <laughs> hesitate. We're not going to do uh, mic running, which is to say they will appear, and then I will call on you. I will be told who in the audience has a question, and somehow it'll magically all work. Um, you know, <laughs> earlier in the conversation, you mentioned rare earth minerals. You brought up all the no. really precious rare earth minerals that are required to make lithium batteries, EV yeah. batteries. Yeah. Yeah. And the New York Times has done extraordinary work reporting. I think you're okay. Okay. Yeah, I Can you hear me? Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Just every time I start asking a tough question, they don't with the microphone. I'm paranoid. <laughs> I'm paranoid about this now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The Times has d did an extensive series recently about what it takes to do this mining, specifically in the Democratic Republic of Congo, mm. how difficult, treacherous, and dangerous destructive to the environment, how much corruption there was. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask both of you to really walk us through what you're doing to ensure that your supply chains are clean. Because I don't need to tell you, especially here in the center of technology, when people rush headlong into new technological innovations, there are often these second order effects that can be just unanticipated but absolutely devastating to communities mm -hmm. that are far from the front mm -hmm. lines yeah. of your product adoption. So Peter, let's start with you. What are you doing to make sure that all these products, all the materials you use in this beautiful $87,000, $100,000 car are not causing problems way down the supply chain? Yeah, well, the, the, there is a limit as a, as a small company for our, our reach right to the mines. I have to be, be honest with you about that. But we work with world-class suppliers. We've got two great suppliers for, for, our, for ourselves, uh, both LG Chem and uh, Samsung SDI. Um, we, in both instances, we reduce the amount of cobalt content. Uh, we use an NMC uh, compound, which is uh, an 811 ratio, which is using half the amount of cobalt from the previous generation. Uh, I think that nickel is an issue, certainly that has an impact, perhaps more so than, 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 than lithium, although the cells are called lithium iron. Uh, we're doing all that we can uh, within the scope of being a small uh, st a startup EV company. Okay, so it sounds like there's more work to do, which leads directly into a question for a bigger company. You are an enormous <laughs> automaker. You have power with suppliers. Are you using it? What can you do? You said you've already sourced materials to yeah. get to that 6,000 number. Uh, 600,000 number for next year. What does it look like inside Ford as you try to contract responsibly down the supply chain and make sure that these problems uh, aren't things that you're contributing to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ford has always been really pretty serious about making sure that we do the right thing, right? Whether it's from a sustainability perspective or from an environmental, social, and governance perspective. Um, so we've we've published our ESG report um, for multiple years now, and then also. Um, all the way down to the, the suppliers, we make sure that we work with our top suppliers to, to check to see where um, our, those materials are coming from and, and making sure that they're coming um, in a way that meets our um, environmental, social, and governance um, 
policy at the company. Um, so that is definitely something that we've focused on and um, all the way down to the um, raw material levels. Okay, I, we're gonna see if this actually works. We have an audience question specifically about mining from Emma. Do we have Emma in the room with a microphone? Is this gonna work? I think it's magically gonna work. Look at that, see? Paper and pencil. Um, oh, hi, okay, my name's Emma. I'm from Errol Foundation. We are a philanthropy here based in the Bay Area. I'm curious what your positions are on deep sea mining. This is a very contentious space for environmental activists and philanthropists. Um, and I'm just curious what your perceptions are about developing nickel and cobalt free batteries. I know Tesla has some of that in the works. And yeah, just curious about your position. Thanks. So if someone came to you and said, we can uh, mine nickel and cobalt from the seabed floor, would you be buying it? We would have to take a very deep, a cautious, analytical approach to assess the, the, the environmental impact. I, I'm very cautious about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. For you? Yeah, I, I would be similar. I mean, I, I, I'm not familiar with us doing anything in terms of deep sea. Um, mining um, at Ford, but I, I think that would be um, very much an interesting issue to think through. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and Emma, you raised an important question, which is, you know, is it possible, is there work being done to develop batteries that don't require these minerals, or at least substantially less? I think, Peter, you alluded to this earlier, smaller batteries maybe would need fewer resources. But walk us through what you all expect the technology curve to look like in the years ahead when it comes to actually you being able to get more charge, longer range, with uh, few or perhaps even none of these minerals. Is that possible? Linda, let's start with you. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're actually, we've announced launching is um, our LFP batteries, uh, lithium um, phosphate, iron phosphate, right? So from that perspective, it takes a lot of those um, specific chemicals down. And then also, even in our batteries today, we've done a really good job of trying to limit um, our cobalt usage um, so that, um, you know, in, in terms of the chemistry development. So I think there's definitely a lot of opportunity as chemistry develops and what we can do in terms of ener maintaining energy efficiency, safety, and, and all, of, all of the different aspects of what a battery needs to do from a power supply perspective, while at the same time making sure that it's um, um, minimized where it can be. Mm -hmm. Peter. Well, I mean, I mean there's a, there are a lot of great hope for uh, breakthroughs in battery technology. Uh, and I, I don't want to sound too bearish here, but battery technology hasn't been advancing as rapidly as the world would have you believe over the last few years. Um, uh, there's a lot of hope that we'll get solid state uh, batteries. That's flattered to deceive for the last decade. And the real issue is industrializing that technology. Um, Solid state uh, solutions have existed at lab level for a number of years now, yet to see uh, an affordable, uh, a scaled solution for electric cars. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, we've, there's, been, there's been great strides in cobalt content, as, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, but we're really pursuing a different ax axis here. We're looking at the rest of the car. Can we go further for a given amount of battery. I think so many people are looking at a breakthrough, can the battery do more? We're looking to be less dependent upon the battery, go further with a smaller battery, and got that axis. And that is the axis that we're able to pursue, uh, looking at all aspects of optimizing the vehicle, through the electric motor, through the efficiency of that motor, through the switching, the power electronics, the algorithms in the software that control that motor to minimize electronic hysteresis. Uh, just the aerodynamics of the car, the rolling resistance with the rubber compounds. So we will need less batteries by making better use of the batteries that we do deploy. Mm. Got it. Uh, sorry, I'm seeing magical questions come in here. I've got my own. Um, I, I, what you just said, though, made me think of something, and I haven't fully articulated this in, in my own mind, but you said you know, the battery technology is not moving as quite the speed, mm. which is very counterintuitive. I mean, I feel like so much of the messaging from the industry, yeah. from analysts, it is. Is, is that we're yeah. on this 
path yeah. and yeah. that you know, we're, we're making breakthroughs by the, by the month. Why is that not the case? Is it a technological problem? Is it yeah. an investment problem? It's, it's, it, it, it's the laws of physics, technology. It's problem. the laws of physics yeah. and technology. So what does that portend for the wide scale adoption and to really be able to get to a place where uh, uh, one charge, for example, well, I, I, can go as far as a tank of gas. I think everyone's looking for a panacea here, looking for 50% breakthroughs. Mm. Um, you just we're seeing a few percent per annum grinding improvement of battery, gravimetric, and volumetric energy density. And that in itself will lead to a breakthrough stage. We're already at a breakthrough where we can, with Lucid Air, get over 500 miles range. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you look at, well, my vision for the future is when we need to look at a whole bunch of things, stars are aligning. We need to look not just how much energy there is in a battery, but its tolerance to being cyclically fast charged. And there's quite a bit of advancement of, in that arena in the last few years. We need to look at how mature the charging infrastructure is. Mm -hmm. Because if I knew there was a fast charger in every street corner, like I know there's a, there's a gas station in every street corner, I don't get gasoline range anxiety because I know there's a, there's, a, there's a gas station everywhere. If I knew there was a fast charger that was reliable everywhere, I wouldn't need to carry the antidote for range anxiety on the car by virtue of having a long range vehicle. So the great paradox here is although we've created really the longest range vehicles on the market, I see the future of actually vehicles with shorter range, smaller batteries, close proximity to charging. And that way, we can, I imagine a vehicle which would have maybe 150 miles range, and that would be sufficient for most people because you can just you can charge anywhere. Mm -hmm. And supposing we could get to six miles per kilowatt hour, we could do that 150 miles with just a 25 kilowatt hour pack. And that's gonna have a profound impact upon the widespread adoption of EVs, that would be a quarter of the cost. Uh, a, a big pack can cost an automaker over $20,000 to make. Mm. That's not the price to the customer, that's the cost of an automaker making that pack to put in the car. If we can quarter the size with this thesis of more efficiency, fast chargers everywhere, chemistry that it, uh, can take that fast charging, we could quarter the cost of that battery, get it down from around 20,000 to closer to four or 5,000, okay. and that's what's gonna have the transformative effect. Okay, Linda, you talked about going with the F-150 Lightning because it was a working truck, it was one of the most popular trucks, and you went to your customer base and you said, is this something you'll recognize as a truck? I want to challenge you on, on just how much buy-in you're actually getting. And, and I say this because I did some reporting, and I was down there in Georgia, and I was speaking with landscapers who said that they were worried about buying the truck because they just simply didn't believe that it was going to have enough charge to haul their trailer full of lawnmowers and everything to several job sites over the course of the day and still have a charge. So are you really getting buy-in from the people who use these trucks as trucks to fill them with construction size and haul trailers all day? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. We have a really good relationship with our commercial customers and with Ford Pro. And that's one of the things that we actually um, incorporated into the development of the vehicle is we calculated with our um, commercial customers how much they need in terms of range on a daily basis for landscapers, for folks that are you know, using the, the vehicle for work. And honestly, the number was actually 200 miles. Um, that, was our, that was our bogey to try to hit. Mm -hmm. And as you probably know, we've, we're now up to 240 on the standard range battery. So you, you get quite a bit of extra. Um, now you're right that when you, you know, tow and you haul and you do work type of things, it does take more from the battery. That's just pure physics. Um, so, you know, th those are the things that we actually incorporated into the, the truck in the development of that. And uh, a lot of our, um, you know, the, the benefit of having, you know, all of the different connectivity in the vehicle is we can actually see what customers are doing um, in, in aggregate, right? And what we're seeing is 90% of truck users whether it's gas or electric, it doesn't even matter. Not over 90% of them d drive less than 80 miles a day. Mm -hmm. 
So therefore, if you think about it from that perspective, kind of toward where Peter was saying, we've really built in a lot more into the battery for the range anxiety, for those edge cases where you do need to go a longer route and you may need to fast charge, right? So as infrastructure develops and progresses over time, as battery technology progresses even further, um, I, I, I think you can definitely take the size of the batteries down to make it a lot more affordable mm -hmm. um, and still very usable. Mm -hmm. so. One of the things I, I cover on the climate desk is, is the intersection of uh, politics, the culture wars, and climate. And it, it has not been lost on me that over the last several months especially, there is really a, a, an effort uh, among some on the far right, I would characterize it, that's my words, to vilify, to demonize electric vehicles. And you need only turn on certain uh, news stations and hear people ranting about them and ranting about federal subsidies of these technologies. And again in Georgia, this is a reporting trip I did earlier in the year, I was covering the development of a large-scale electric vehicle factory, and there was huge opposition to it on the ground because it got wrapped up in conspiracy theories about George Soros. And so as you laugh, but this is, this is, this is real, right? This is, this is the country we live in, as we all know. But the question for you, Linda, is especially as you start to sell an electric truck, across this country, in all 50 states, in every zip code, red and blue, are Republicans buying these trucks? Or is this really a Democratic truck? I have no idea. We've never done that kind of estimate. But what I can tell you is, um, actually, you know, in terms of the truck usage, um, we do have a lot of truck users that buy this vehicle. Half of our, half, half of our buyers for Lightning is actually um, coming out of a truck, and half of them are new to truck. And this is all of the you know, different things that this electric truck enables that a gas truck couldn't do, right? So we're bringing those folks in, and um, you know, we're bringing definitely a lot of folks into EV. Two-thirds of them are actually all new to EV, so that's exciting news. And then three-fourths of them are actually new to Ford. So I don't know the political demographic, but those are the demographics that I do have that I can share with you. Hmm. <laughs> Peter, what's your demo? Um, well, y y you're asking an engineer from the other side of the world to understand American politics. <laughs> and uh, I, I know my place. <laughs> fair. And, I, and I'm happy with it. Yeah, fair enough. Um, well, we're, we're running short on time. Uh, but Peter, I want to ask you, Lucid is obviously, as we started the conversation with, facing some real challenges right now on the production side. Uh, the stock. Uh, chart, not that everyone's stock chart looks pretty this year, but it's been a very difficult year for the stock. I know the stock market is not the economy or your company's capitalization, but analysts have concerns as well. Can you give us a realistic forecast about your ability to ramp up production, meet your capitalization needs, and still be, I'm mean, going to just be frank, an ongoing concern a year from now? This is a real question. Well, I, I'm personally taking charge of the ramp up. I'm leading from the front on the shop floor with a brilliant team around me. Uh, the workforce in Arizona is totally pumped. We're making the best car on the planet. I'm hugely optimistic. We just announced this morning that in Q3, we tripled our output from Q2. And I want to just propel the company on that trajectory. We're doing the right thing. The world needs what we're doing. We're advancing the technology, and it's going to really catalyze the mass adoption of EVs. And that's what this planet needs. And I'm buoyed and I'm propelled by that. That's our mission. And this is more than a job for me. This is a mission because I really care about this planet. Are you confident in the finances of the company? Do you have what you need we've to get got, into next year? And are sales going to help backstop the capitalization? Absolutely. We, we've got enough to get, last us well into next year. And we've got a world-class backer with the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia who really have a, a long-term partnership with us with a mutual vision for really a more sustainable environment. That opens a can of worms that we do not have time to get into. It's true. And I regret we didn't start there. <laughs> Linda, the F-150 is obviously uh, experiencing high demand right now. 
the Mustang Mach-E is starting to sell, but this is still a infinitesimal part of the Ford portfolio, a real small slice of your annual sales. What's it gonna take for the whole company to start sort of rowing in this direction? What's your projection for when you start seeing, uh, again, your sales of internal combustion engines, which as I said at the top, remain the contributor to the largest carbon dioxide footprint in this country right now, really start to move down and see your EV sales start to make up a significant minority or even a majority of your overall sales? Yeah, we're definitely moving there and very fast, right? We're trying to industrialize and, and develop vehicles to, to meet that. We've announced over $50 billion from now to, 20, um, to 2030 to get to um, even more vehicles. And our goal is uh, 2 million units by 2030, which is about 50% globally um, from an EV perspective. Do you agree with what Peter said, that the Lucid Air is the best car in the world? Well, I think it's uh, up to our customers to decide. And I think a lot of customers will look at Lucid and go, that's a great vehicle. And a lot of other customers will look at the Mach-E or the Transit or the Lightning and say, that's a great vehicle. You didn't and say I the think... best truck in the world. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I think, you know, regardless, we're, we're all here trying to really do the same thing, right? We have the same mission in terms of trying to make great products that our customers love. And if they're wanting to, you know, now tra transition to an EV vehicle instead of gas vehicle, that's just a little bit more sustainable for the environment. So all in all, it's a, it's a good thing. I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and ask one last question to Peter. You brought it up. You said your largest backer was the Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. fund. Mm -hmm. Did you have any qualms partnering with them given both their deep involvement in the fossil fuel industry and their commitment, as we know from Aramco, to continuing to expand oil and gas production at an extraordinary rate into the foreseeable future, as well as their human rights record? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think there's a, the, 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 there's a shared vision. You've got to look at the, the good that we can do. There's a shared vision to make this world uh, have a transportation model which is more environmentally sustainable. They have a model to go to a green economy for 2030. Um, we've had great examples of collaboration. We've had young Saudi interns, male and female, experience cosmopolitan California working with us and then going back to their society. And this is just one example of how we can catalyze change for the better, which is actually going to benefit the whole world. You get the sense. We could continue this conversation all day, but we do not have time. Thank you very much both, Linda and Peter. Very much appreciated. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.